Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Kid Missing Radio. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, today, my name is Angelina Wilson, your host. Today's show is about Curtis Crosby. He's a 60 year old African American male who is missing from South Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, He was transplanted there after Hurricane Katrina and did much volunteer work helping other transplants. He was between 5'9 and 5'10 and balding. I have joining me his daughter, Jamie Crosby, and private investigator, Jason Jensen. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Um... Now, I know the missing persons report didn't get made until February. Is is that because everybody lives so far away they didn't realize he was actually missing? Um, I think around, we did the missing persons report maybe in December. We just asked for a wellness check because when we started to compare notes between my sister and I and my uh, uncle who's now deceased, we all realized that we hadn't talked to my dad in a few months. So we formally came out to Utah to actually make the missing persons report after we um, came looking for him to make sure that he was just not answering the phone to us to make sure that um, he was actually missing. So we did a wellness check in December of 2014, and then we did the missing persons formally in February of 2015. Well, that makes sense. And they're always going to say, well, adults have a right to be missing, I suppose. Right. But he was an older man, and it was said that he might have had, I heard either you or your sister say he might have had dementia. Well, based on what some of the neighbors said, that um, sometimes he would be a little confused or disoriented, or they would have to help him back home because he would get confused wouldn't know where, I guess, his apartment was. Yeah. That was news to us, but that happened in February when we actually went to Utah. Prior to us going to Utah, we had no knowledge of any uh, disorientation or any confusion because our conversations with him were pretty normal. Yeah. Well, I can tell you from that experience that they hide it well. So if you live with the person day to day, you may see the slight changes. But overall, they hide it well, because my father suffered from dementia at the end of his life. And he was so mm-hmm. confused that he tried to to leave the bedroom that we had him in, because we changed bedrooms, out the window to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. Oh, no, wow. Dad, the door's over here. So, you know, and he would hide it from most of the rest of the world. They didn't know. And they probably thought we were entirely crazy, because we're like, he doesn't remember anything. So if you live with the person, you might see it. Otherwise, they may hide it from you. So I don't find it hard to believe. Um, That could have been a part of it. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm I'm so sorry. That could have been a part of it. It's just not something that we knew until we came out there. We didn't really have, you know, real proof of that because we didn't really know the neighbors. That's just what they were telling us once we went out and tried to ask them had they seen him. Now, um, before I ask Jason about how he got involved, your father had a living girlfriend? He did uh, have a living girlfriend that we um, had maybe spoken on the phone with once or twice. Um, They had been together for quite some time because he was in Utah for uh, quite a while. Um, Right. And she, yeah, he had a living girlfriend. I'm not really sure of much information on her. Right, and the last place he was seen was in an abandoned office building five blocks from his apartment. Now, the police on one hand said they found an eviction notice, and on another hand, I thought it said he his belongings were given to his girlfriend. So I'm not sure which it is. So um, the last time I believe that my dad went missing around October, so that was um, maybe two months before an eviction notice was placed on the uh, on the door. 
because we spoke with property management and they gave us the date maybe uh, November of 2014. And I think they finally moved everything out December of 2014. When he was found sleeping in the abandoned building around the corner from his um, apartment, he was actually still living in the apartment. There had been no eviction filed, so we didn't know why he was sleeping in that building. There'd be a lot of reasons. Maybe he couldn't find his way home, or maybe he mm -hmm. had him confused. You, you never do know. Right. Um, I do love your father's quote. I'm too stressed. I'm too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> he I really believed that. that. He didn't. If I called him and I was frantic or I was stressed out, he was like, "Don't worry about it. It's gonna work out." Like, don't stress out. You're too blessed to be stressed. He liked, he liked to use uh, taglines and things like that. He, he also used to always tell people one love. Everybody always referred to him as Mr. One Love. They knew him as Curtis One Love on New Orleans. Oh, that's sweet. Um, Jason, how did you yes. become involved in this? Well, that's... Um Quite easy, actually. Um, I'm I'm a co-founder of the Utah Cold Case Coalition, and in August of last year, we held uh, a month called Cold Case Month, and one of the 37 cases we featured during August, I selected Curtis Crosby as one of them, and because of my interest in the case and my research, I looked up Jamie's sister, Jasmine, and gave her a call, offered our free services to her to see if we could help find him for the family. And to dismay, we, we noticed from my research, he has not popped up on any radars of anything, not using his Social Security number, not uh, having another address since. Is South Salt Lake address, so you know clearly he is truly a missing person, but not in the sense of just being disconnected from his family, you know, running around the world trying to reinvent himself. No, he's truly off the off the radar. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah, that's the worst kind of missing person that you can have, uh, other than. If it's a small child missing, this is the one that you know really catches people's imaginations. They're like, "Well, why would he? Why would he leave?" Well, you know, clearly from his roots being uh, in Utah for nine years, with his roots really transplanted here and running his nonprofit survivors and you know helping feeding the homeless and things like that, he wasn't going anywhere. There was no reason to leave. So, you know, uh, a lot of speculation goes into uh, thinking, well, why was Mr. Crosby in that empty apart, I mean, empty office building? Uh, come to my mind, uh, being a cold case expert, I've surmised three most like explanations. Uh, the first being, you know, the, on, the sudden onset of, some kind of mental illness, which, you know, there's speculation about it, but the only ones that ever claimed it were those directly to the family when they came knocking on his apartment door. And I call it into question the validity of those claims. Maybe there's some kind of explanation like a cover-up or something because nobody else reported that kind of behavior. So another possible explanation would be the possible uh, abuse or use of illegal substances, and there was no record of that. And if that were the case, after four years, by now, he would have probably been caught or arrested or something like that, and that would have yeah. caused him to be you know, brought to light. So the only third possible explanation would be Fair. He was avoiding his own apartment for some, you know, unknown reason that would um, 
caused him to be afraid to go home. He knew he was in danger or something like that. Because uh, he have in the cold case, in the, 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 the cold case investigation world, there are no such things as coincidences. Just like in a domestic violence, when a, someone finds themselves murdered, uh, it's no coincidence that that victim a week earlier went to the hospital with a broken arm. Much like here, where we got a, an oddity in October of 2014, where he's off in some bizarre location five blocks from his own apartment. Shortly thereafter, he finds himself missing entirely. I I worry that when the police uh, collected his things at that empty space and took him back to his apartment that in the course of doing so the police informed whomever they had spoken to where they collected his things and then that person went and found him that's what I think happened to him Um, so I think that uh, I think the reason why he's he's not available found and I cleared this with uh, with uh, Jamie and Jasmine earlier today. I think uh, he's been murdered. You know, I wonder about. I don't wonder about. Like, I don't know how to put it. Let me just put it this way. I wonder what the motive would be. Oh, I can think of a half a dozen, but remember, motive is not. Uh, necessarily an element of the crime. Motive is just to help explain to a jury why suspect X committed the crime. There, there's half a dozen reasons why somebody would want to kill somebody. Love, revenge, greed. you gotta, you got to remember Mr. Crosby had a, a thriving business, the, 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 the nonprofit survivors. Maybe somebody relating to that. Maybe they thought he was a quick source of some cash, or maybe maybe uh, he was living in a hostile neighborhood and there was a drug dealer on the block that he was trying to clean the street up, and they thought he snitched him out, so they took care of that. There's a, you know, it can happen from a number of reasons, but until you get a suspect and can understand the nature of their relationship, you can't really develop a motive until then. That's that's because all we know is that he's missing, but why is he missing? Well, he could be deliberately concealed. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <coughs> now I understand that you tracked down his girlfriend. I don't know whether she talked to police or not. She wasn't very helpful to you, was she? <laughs> well, you know, um, I don't have any re- suspect her of anything. I, I do know that uh, she's had a troubled past herself, and that may be what drew them together. Maybe they became friends because they had, uh, you know, some unique backgrounds that drew, drew them together. But... Um, you know, I don't know why they broke up or if they broke up. The only thing I know is that when I contacted the girlfriend, she informed me that she was concerned about his disappearance and that she and I were supposed to get back uh, together and meet to discuss the details of what her theories were, but we haven't been successful to coordinate that. And it's You know, she's going through some tough times, and maybe she's got some trust issues. I don't know. You know, I am a private investigator. Sometimes people wonder why I'm contacting her if there's a hidden agenda for that. So I don't have any immediate reason to be fearful of her, although since she was living in the neighborhood and knew best who uh, Curtis interacted with, She'd be a prime person to get some details on the most recent activities and the background concerning, you know, Mr. Crosby, including 
these rumors that he was suffering some some dementia or some cum- some confusion. That's true. Because usually the closest people to you, the people you're with day to day, will notice it first. Right. Right. And if they were living together, even if they were just roommates and not lovers, uh, she would have some better understanding anyway of of Mr. Crosby's day to day life than I would have because I didn't know him at all, and his daughters were too far away to have that day to day interaction as well. Um, I just I wanted to ask Jamie. We've kind of started to make your father a real person on the show, and I always try to do that with the missing people that I profile um, because I think it gets people people more interested. It has more value to people if they can see the person. So can you tell us about your dad, what kind of dad he was, what he was like growing up and all that? Um, my dad was always a fun, loving person. Um, he had a lot of kids. Um, he was a middle child of three. Um, he was always, when he came around, always smiling, always pleasant. I never remember a time when my dad raised his voice. Um, he had a lot of cousins, a lot of aunts and uncles and friends, and everybody always loved him. Um, he moved away for a short, well, for a little while when I was younger, and he came back when I was a teenager, and he was always around. If I needed to help move, if I needed a new floor put down, he would always be there to help me out. Um, he was just always excited and happy and, you know, he'd come in the room, his smile lit up the room. He was always a pleasant person to me and to my sisters and brothers as well. Um, he was always positive. When Katrina hit, he was like, oh, no, we're going to stay. We're going to ride it out. We're going to watch everybody's house in the neighborhood. And unfortunately, it was too much for them. So he got one of his friends. Um, they were all kind of camping out watching the neighborhood. And it was my uncle's um, plumbing building, and it was three stories. So as the water began to rise, they went to the top, and they got rescued from the roof. And um, like the reports always say, he never knew where he was going. He just heard the pilot say, welcome to Salt Lake City, Utah. And despite him being displaced, um, he was always a traveler. He liked to go places. So that was just a new adventure for him. So he embraced it even you know, though he had a hard time getting ID, he had a hard time getting um, settled. Once he did get settled, he helped everyone else who may have been having a hard time. He helped them get settled as well. So he embraced his new location. Um, he started feeding the homeless, uh, finding resources for himself and other people, and he was always that person. If he found out about something, he made sure everybody else knew how to find a resource or how to benefit from it. I like that. I, I think everyone should do that. <clears throat> you know, if you know of a resource that helped you and maybe can help other people, you should let them know. I totally agree with that. He was definitely an advocate of spread the word. Like, when he got to you, so he was like, y'all got to come see this. Unfortunately, we never got a chance to go see it with him, but we did go see it, and when we got there, we saw why he was so amazed with the um, with the city of Salt Lake City. Wow. Well, yeah, there, isn't there a big temple, Mormon temple, that looks like a big castle in yes. the middle of the city? Yes. Like the main temple, right? Maybe? Yes. In, in, oh, in yeah. downtown, I one, believe. Yeah, downtown, one of the original temples, well, especially here, you know, they, they've moved around across the country and there was an earlier temple but yeah that's the first one in Utah after they've uh, established themselves here yeah I've seen it but I've only seen it like on YouTube because I watch as I was saying before we started the show um, vloggers out of Logan which is almost two hours from uh, Salt Lake right but I do know for those who don't know, they call Salt Lake City Salt Lake City because that's where the Great Salt Lake is. Correct. It's all salt crust now, right? There's no water. What? Right? It's all salt crust. There's no water. 
No, no, we have a we have a huge lake here still. At west no, I of Salt west lake of itself. west of the Great Salt Lake, there's the Salt Flat. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, west west of the Great, Great Salt, Salt lake, lake is the Salt Flat. Yeah. That's where they like do the Bonneville Raceway and things like that. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I know the climate's very different than New Orleans. That's for sure. Oh yeah, yeah, it's dry here and, and down there. Last time I was down there, it was humid. Yeah, New Orleans is uh, flat. First of all, there are no mountains, no hills, um, and we're surrounded by water. So it's a totally different atmosphere, climate. Um, everything is so different. Even well, everything is different. Like when my dad came back to New Orleans the last time I saw him. He was just comparing everything. It's like, yes, in Utah. It's like that in Utah. He was comparing everything from Salt Lake City to New Orleans, to the new New Orleans, because he only knew New Orleans before Katrina. Right. Very different now, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's human nature. I'm over here. I'm looking at the – there was an eviction case that was filed in January of 2015. Mm-hmm. The notice in the the documents filed with the court showed that they served an eviction notice by certified mail and by taping it in a conspicuous place at the location, which typically is they tape it to the door. And that happened yep. on December 14th, uh, 2014. So yeah. well after yeah. his yeah. disappearance yeah. in October. Yeah, so the police couldn't have seen That's it why. in October. Yeah, everything I was do fine in October. The- I, I talked to him. I talked to him in October. After October is kind of when the communication ceased altogether. Even if it was a one or two minute conversation, I would still talk to my dad at least once a week, every two weeks, just to do a post check. October third, right. which was my mom's my mom's birthday, and she was deceased. So I was kind of feeling some type of way. So I called my dad to talk to him, and he was kind of rushing, like he had something to do. So I was like, all right, I'll call you later. So I didn't call him back for a couple of weeks. Like two weeks, he didn't answer. I called him again. He didn't answer. Then a couple of weeks, then Thanksgiving, I'm like, hold on. He's busy or whatever, I'll catch up with him. Because I know he used to feed the homeless and do different things. So, of course, if he wasn't there on Thanksgiving, it didn't really alarm me. Uh, his birthday was December 20th, right before Christmas. Couldn't get in touch with him. Christmas, I couldn't get in touch with him. That's when we started comparing notes, like, hold on. Has anybody talked to him? Um, right. And, like, I think December 30th is when I called the police and asked them to do a wellness check. And at that point, um, they said that nothing was out of place. They said everything was as if he had just gotten up and went to work. Everything was still intact the way it was. And that's when they started telling us about the backpack. He had left it somewhere, but they hadn't told us about the building yet. They just said that he had left it somewhere and he brought the backpack back. But, of course, it came up missing. Um, once we got there in February of 2015, that's when we started putting the pieces together based on dates and times and sightings and different things like that. So, yeah, the, the whole eviction thing came after he was missing. He wasn't evicted and living in a building. He was living in a building with an apartment, and that's the part that started setting on bells that something wasn't right before he yeah. was evicted. Right. <clears throat> yeah, that was certainly the, and, and, and the particular apartment building that he was living at was the housing authority for, for Salt Lake County. So it, it uh-huh. was low-income housing which can house any anybody Anybody. basically that's low income uh, ranging Mm -hmm. from people that are disturbed to people that are recovering addicts to you name it not just the 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 poor but you never know Mm -hmm. what your neighbor's like so you never know if this had something to do with his neighbor yeah Mm -hmm. we have see we have that same problem here you we put our elderly and our disabled in the same apartment complexes that we put our severely mentally ill, our drug addicts, yep. and it's like, 
Okay, that's safe. Not. It's not safe at all. No, my 80 year old aunt lives in one of those. It, it, it makes her very nervous. You know. Oh yeah, and, 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 it, 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 and the Go sad ahead, reality sorry. of it is, is you can put, and you know, like an old elderly couple that are scared of everybody in the same building as some cracked out your recovering addict that's just one day away from his next drug bust. You know, it's it's sad. Yeah. But uh it is. housing that these people find themselves in and you could be the the nicest, meekest person, but you know, like uh Curtis was reported to have uh PTSD and and that can that can be even common with like a, a returned veteran. Yes, you right. know, so you got PTSD. You're funny. living in you're living in housing, and the the neighbor guy uh, might be dangerous. Mhm. And he was and pretty self sufficient, pretty strong, pretty stable. He was pretty good the whole time he was there, from what he told us. Now. Again, uh, the neighbors supposedly said that, well, they told us that he supposedly had episodes where he was confused and different things like that. So initially when he moved in, he probably was able to handle his own, no matter what the situation was or no matter who his neighbors were. But if, in fact, he had a mental breakdown or some sort of um, memory lapse or anything like that, at that point that would leave him vulnerable. And, you know, oh, people exactly. pay attention to all different, yeah, they'll pay attention to when you're ill or when you're strong, when you're weak, and that just may be a part of what happens. Somebody was paying attention and say, hey, here's a target. He's not who he used to be. There's Curtis. Yeah. I did want to ask. Well, yeah, and I would now, think that because he was featured in the news at times and that because he was on the service side of the homeless if somebody on the other side that he was serving saw him as a target and he's the act you know he's accessible he's he's personable uh and they think that he's success i can see where he'd be a target for somebody absolutely and he definitely was a giver he was a definitely was a giver he would give you the shirt off of his back if he was eating, well, yeah. He I mean, we know eating, that from the passive. we know that from the whole Katrina experience, where he yeah. volunteered to stay back to help out on the neighbors, and you know, Katrina yeah. was just bigger and overwhelm too overwhelming for him. But his heart was always at found at the right place. If he was yeah, eating, and you said he was hungry, was. he would pass his plate. He definitely was. So he was a giver, also. Um, and like I said, if in fact he had. Um, some kind of mental lapse or memory issue or anything, that would make him a target in a neighborhood such as that where it's very diverse and you have all different people of all different backgrounds and mental capacities there. So we just just really want to know what happened. It's not even a closure thing. It's a, it's a, a, we just need to know, like, what happened? Where is he? What happened? Is he out there? Is he not? Just for peace of mind. I wouldn't even say closure, just for peace of mind. That's right. That's right. right. In fact, if there was one thing that we could uh, obtain to make this this broadcast a success would be that that anybody that knows what happened to, to Curtis, if they step forward now, we can ensure them protection, uh, We'd rather have the, the, the legal community treat them as a witness who's going to assist in some type of prosecution rather than that their, let their silence hold them to the case as if they were an accomplice or a co-conspirator. So we know somebody out there knows something. We just want them to come forward, and we're hoping that your your show would help facilitate that. Oh, I certainly hope so. And if, if, I want to give out the phone numbers. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If there's one person that has one clue or one idea of what happened, that one person can step forward with some information. But the, the not knowing is what's driving us insane. We just want to know what happened, where is he, because this is totally out of character. 
It's not a coincidence. Something happened, and we just want to know what happened. That's right. That's right. And it's real easy for us to keep an open mind and hear the story without casting disbursements or or judgments against the person talking to us because we know that people change. We know that uh, people are, are capable of redemption. But where that redemption starts is first coming forward and letting us know what happened. Yep. Um, I want to do a couple of things. I want to give out the phone numbers real quick. Now, South Salt Lake is not Salt Lake, right? It's not South Salt Lake, Lake is its own municipality okay. below, um, you know, south of Salt Lake. Okay. Their phone number is 801-840-4000. That's the South Salt Lake PD. Jensen Investigations is 801-596-2444. Utah Cold Case Two, Coalition is... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Did I get the number wrong? Uh, I don't. I couldn't tell from my end, but it's uh, 801 596 2455. Oh, 2455. Oh, my goodness. Right. I'm so sorry. Um, no, it's the okay. Utah Cold Case Coalition is 1385 CLUE, that's C L U E, 313. Um, I want, I just ran out of time. But I want to thank you both for being here. Um, yeah, I want to remind everyone to put your DNA on GEDmatch when you do your DNA and opt in for law enforcement use. They can't see your name or your profile or anything. All they see is your data, the A's, P's, and G's. It helps to identify unidentified people, find killers, things like that. Well, well, and you know also to find missing, uh, we do have uh, a profile relating to to uh, Curtis Crosby on Jed Match. So if they do find him as a John Doe somewhere, they can find his family ancestry through Jed Match. That's terrific. And I just want to let everyone know that there has been an update in the Bobby Ann Campbell case. Is that correct? Uh, Bobby Ann Campbell? Yes. No, no. I haven't had any updates on Bobby Ann Campbell. Oh, I thought I saw it on your um, page. But to conclude, I just want to say Curtis looks like a happy guy, a funny guy. And I certainly hope that you get your dad back in one way or another, hopefully in a good way. I want to thank you both for coming on the show. I so appreciate it. Well, it was our pleasure. Thank you. My next show is in two weeks. Um, And I'm not looking at it at this moment. But it's in two weeks. It's on the 22nd. I'd like everyone to please listen. Again, thank you, Jason, for contacting me. Thank you, Jamie, for agreeing to do this. Thank you, Jasmine, for listening. Um, one last thing. I know we ran out of time, but it still records anyway. Do um, you want to say anything to your dad in case he's out? Um, you have a lot of people looking for you. A lot of people love you and a lot of people waiting for you to come home. Thank you both. Goodbye, good night, and God bless everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>